So following up from the last video where I was showing how to pull the barrel out of the handle on this thing, uh, I've got it apart now and I, I see what it was that was sort of jammed in there. The Here's what I was describing. There's a metal clamp and it's kind of ugly. I don't really like it. Uh, the reason I don't, well, I, there's a few reasons I really don't like the way they did this. I really, really don't like it and they could have done a lot better. Um, first reason is it grabs the rubber sheathing. That's no good. It needs to hold on to this cord that's embedded in the cable. That's there to give the cable tensile strength. Uh, instead it's holding on to the rubber sheathing and as you can see the sheathing's all bunched up on the upwind side of the clamp and it's stretched on the downwind side. That's because as you pull on it it's, it's going to allow all the stuff inside the sheathing to slide back inside of it and the sheathing will get forced up and bunch up on over all this stuff. It's, it's a terrible way to do it. The other reason I don't like it is look at the shape of this. I mean for one it looks like a mangled up piece of recycled junk. Uh, which, whatever, that's just an aesthetic complaint. I'm not that fussy, but I do like to bitch and complain. However, the inside of the handle, uh, I'm making an assumption here, but looking for, through it with my eye, it, it, it looks like it's just a kind of a smooth conical opening inside, like a bore cut inside the handle, well, molded. Really, there should be a flat abutment or a ridge or something or even a hook shaped thing or I mean if I designed it I would have a pin going right through the outside nicely you know shaped to leave a smooth surface or maybe even hide it up here under the grip you know make it so you slide the grip off and there's a screw threaded in or a roll pin you push out and have that designed so that it goes through maybe you could have you know if this end was hooked Kind of like the ones on old telephones were made, if you guys are old enough to know, you know, old Western Electric and uh, Northern Telecom stuff, if you're Canadian like me. They had a hook-shaped end on this, and that would be anchored overneath, a, uh, like on a peg of some sort or over a shaft. And that way, you know, it's not just going to get jammed in there and you're going to have a hell of a time pushing it out because it's literally just jammed. So yeah, I would I would redesign this so that there's something externally removable uh, and I get it, it increases the cost. So maybe just mold this with a flat, you know, face in there that's that's perpendicular to the length of the shaft. So instead of wedging into a conical taper, it just sits on a surface that it can lift away from very easily. So it makes it easier to service. But again, yeah, it needs to be clamped to the cord inside the cable. There's no excuse for this. This is actually just awful. Uh, the part that was holding me up, as I mentioned earlier in the previous video, is this little divider. And it's just in there to make sure that all of the cabling is nicely separated. And that's, that's good. That's a nice touch. I don't mind that. However, this thing is wide enough that it actually kind of gets jammed inside the pencil. And I don't like that very much because it means that as the cabling slides through the ineffectively designed cable restraint, what comes next to help it from pulling out? Well, all of this stuff, uh, maybe it's, you know, kind of good that the plastic thing wedges in there because it means that at least the wires will pull on it for a while before they start to yank on the, the irreplaceable bits in the heater element section. But again, this whole thing should be, that should all be floating, uh, or at the very least, it should never have to take up tension. This, that's the job of this thing, which it fails at. So that's, that's kind of, I just had to have a bit of a gripe about this. When I reassemble this, I'm going to change a few things about the way it's designed. Uh, I'm going to keep this part, that's fine with me. However, I am going to, I'm going to probably, I don't know, I may not, cut and reattach the cable. It ha doesn't look like the cable has failed yet like on so many of my other ones. Uh, and I'm starting to think that maybe the reason a lot of these cables are failing isn't so much from bending because they, they do actually have a decent cord restraint on there. This is just slid down. I think it's really because the the sheathing is getting stretched and this is still crimped hard enough that it's still gonna it's still dragging on the stuff inside pretty hard. And so you, you pull on this and then you let go on it and it slides back and things are going to bunch up and curl up in here and the, it doesn't really have anywhere to go except to curl up and, and it, 
it, it just makes a mess. The wires perforate the the sheathing on the inner cables, and it just it just fucks it. And the reason I'm in here in the first place is I noticed that the ground pin from pin five of the connector is no longer connected to the shell, which it really needs to be for safety reasons, but also to keep the signal path for the temperature sensor quiet. And you can see right away, as soon as I got in this, I, I had a giggle because I, I know what I what's going on here. The you can see uh this is like uh not polyamide, capped on whatever we want to call it. It's but it's high temperature tape used usually for like transformers and chokes and stuff. And you can see a hole burned right through it and a little bit of you know what looks like welded metal in there. And also you look and here's the ground lead coming in from the the cabling. I'll try to get into focus here a bit better. And you pull on this and push on it, and you can see the little little doodad shifting back and forth inside the hole where it melted a melted its way through. You see that in there. <laughs> and of course another telltale. There's nothing going between. Well, what the hell? You, I don't know if you can see it on the video. Oh yeah, you can see the little dot in there. There's a little looks like a little blob of solder hiding out in there right on the inner heater barrel. That's what's left of the wire that used to come out and connect to the ground. So, and I know what happened. I don't remember when it happened, but I remember one day I shorted this thing out on something that was live. Like, I mean, right to mains. And uh, it fused this whole wire and exploded it. I mean, it's gone. <laughs> and that bugs me a little bit because it's like, if you're not going to put heavy enough stuff in here to take a 15 amp circuit, which I think they actually should have done, um, put a fuse or a fusible link in the base somewhere so it doesn't destroy the cabling in the iron and make it so it makes the user aware that it's happened because this is a safety issue for two reasons. Um, the first reason is that, well, I'd say it might be three or four reasons. I'll go through them. The first and most important reason in, in this case, I would say, is the user safety. And the reason is that this is not meant to be a double insulated tool nor is it indicated that it is. It is expected that it connects to a grounded receptacle and it is understood that it has a grounded barrel. That's something that the user, end user, you know, is not liable to regularly test. It's kind of like the age old thing with your multimeter. If you're gonna go use it on a high energy circuit that could kill you, test the fucking thing first and make sure it's actually working, you know, bring two. Make sure that they match, they agree with each other. It's not worth the risk. I honestly think this applies here. Yeah, you're not liable to run into trouble in most cases, really, if ever, but it's a good thing to know that this ground is grounded for safety reasons. But it is also important for electrostatic discharge because if that ground is lost, the iron has nowhere to dissipate charge. It's otherwise floating and it has only the capacitance and whatever very small leakage resistance there is across the transformer to get back to the mains. And uh, that leads me to the, the real safety issue of this is because the transformer is the only thing in the way. Let's see here. Uh, kind of not, the camera's not set up very well for this, but I haven't looked the transformer over very carefully to see if it's a you know, a true double insulating style design. And what I mean by that is that I usually have a split bobbin and the windings, instead of being uh, sharing all the same space, they'll be on two separate halves of the bobbin way apart from each other. It just gives it a lot of insulation resistance so it can handle discharges. Let's open it up and look. It is designed that way. Okay, that's good. That's one that's really, so they got the, the secondary winding all the way over on this chunk of the bobbin. They have a nice wide plastic flange molded into it as part of it and then the primary is up here over on its own a lot of separation and a decent amount of gap between the windings and the core so that's 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 still good i still don't like the fact that the the ground is is just asking to get fused out of existence like it's happened to me here um i really think that there should be a way or a rule that they've got to I'd say include some kind of a, you know, right here in the, with the electronics, include a fusible link 
between the system ground and the mains ground and add some kind of an indicator that says, hey, ground fault, we've lost the ground, fix me. And the nice thing about it is it's easy to fix. If it fuses in here, you can get to everything. You really don't want to be taking the pencil apart unless you have absolutely have to. So yeah, I'm kind of going at length and I'm kind of just complaining about this, but I feel that it's important because it's a safety concern, but it is also uh, not just for user safety, it's potentially for the safety of the electronics you're, you're servicing. So yeah, uh, I probably won't do a video on my modifications to this, but you know, basically you can guess, you know, assume a few things about what I've said already. And the main modification that I really would want to make is just, I really want this cord restrained by the tensile cording and nothing else. The rest of it gets to sort of float freely and shift along as it will because it's a bit stretchy. And I'll bet you money that after I make that modification, this pencil might outlast its expectancy by a great margin it certainly would be nice because a lot of folks are finding they have to get new ones about I'd say annually and I've had the same experience with this and other irons of the same model these these just don't last and anybody who's been around long enough to use the old workhorse classic WC uh, TCPT the the really fun one with the Curie switch in it. That's the one where the the tips have little nubs on the ends of them with selected Curie temperatures and a magnet and a, a mechanical switch inside. Kind of clever. It, it heats up until the Curie point of the material is reached. It stops conducting a magnetic field, falls away, opens the switch. That's how those ones regulate temperature. I really liked those. They're not adjustable. However, they had had a tendency to maintain pretty good temperature regulation and they were extremely reliable and for something with a mechanical switch that's sitting in a hot iron handle turning on and off and on and off all day long for years and I mean I've oh, my first iron was one of those and it had been used by the previous user for probably 20 years I put another 10 or 15 years on it and it finally died and it was the switch as I would expect but I mean hell 30 years this is electronic. Enough, there's no moving parts in here. This should outlast the hell out of the old model. And they never do. They don't even come close to the same level of dependability. Um, and because of these silly issues with, I mean, just mainly poor construction quality, but some design flaws, they'll tend to work, but give erratic temperature regulation, which is another thing you, you hope when you have a fully electronic calibrated thermocouple solution with electronic power switching, no moving parts, no switches. You expect this to be precise and repeatable and it's just like wow the mechanical thing from however long ago it would have been, maybe 50 years now, did a better job. <laughs> so it's not all down to theory. Implementation really counts. And that's about all I've got to say on this. Uh, Hopefully this gives people some ideas about what they can do to improve their irons. And as, as I said about the, the uh, fusible link or whatever you could have with the ground here, um, that is something I'm going to add. There's probably reasons why that's not allowed in UL, CSA, whatever standards organization your particular locale refers to. You know, and perhaps even the way Weller has done this is because they have no choice due to federal mandate, which is unfortunate because there are times when, you know, there are these caveats that you've got to catch in a slightly different way. And, you know, that's why kind of why I said it would be maybe either make the ground capable of safely just dealing with all of the current a regular main circuit can handle or make it fused in the base. I prefer the fused approach mainly because that's a lot of current you could be passing and you've got to have a breakage rating that's far beyond, you know, 15 amps. That's why we've got breakers and fuses that are rated for 10 kiloamps. That's critically important safety and uh, I don't know how you would design that into this thing without having it fusible somewhere in a controlled and safe manner and I think it should be in the base 
with some means of indicating to the user that it, it has fused and an easy means to repair that. that sh anybody who's in a position to be using a soldering iron can be expected to have the necessary skills and equipment to repair a broken fusible link or replace a fuse. So yeah, that's, that's, uh, I think that's about all. It's enough for me on videos about this thing, but, uh, yeah, I to, to close, uh, as far as my overall impression of this wonderful idea, some of the implementation is excellent, but enough of the implementation is terrible that I have to say I'm pretty disappointed. Uh, there's just enough things that are trivial to do well and no more expensive or time consuming to do well that were completely overlooked. And I find that to be absolutely unacceptable. I probably won't ever buy another Weller product. Uh, that's enough to between this and the, seeing that so many users have the same problems with these, that uh, turns me off pretty badly. That said, I don't necessarily know if anybody else is doing any better. They can charge a lot of money and have a great name and a great reputation, but Weller had a great reputation too. So the only way to really know is to find out someone else has good experiences with something or, you know, take the plunge and buy one yourself and and take it apart and find out quickly or use it and find out over time what its shortcomings are. And it's just kind of the way the cookie crumbles. All right, that's that.